As national conservatives understand better than most, families matter for every civilization. Why? There can be no great countries without great families. And today, America is destroying family life. How? Feminism and sexual liberation theories above all. And conservatives have been complicit in this too. A genuinely national conservatism will have to be bolder and better. And I'm going to limit myself to discussing the political and personal evils that flow from feminism. Our culture is steeped with feminism. It teaches young boys and girls that they are motivated by much the same things and want much the same things. Thus, girls are told to become as independent, as independent as boys are said to be. Feminism's teaching of androgyny and individualism is a fundamental threat to strong, fruitful families, and a genuine nation cannot exist without strong and fruitful families. A simple truth about national conservatism is this. No national conservatism can be built from the assumptions and aspirations of today's modern, single, independent, urban woman. There is no way to go from sex in the city to national conservatism. There is no way to go from an ethic of individual vanity in the service of fleeting beauty and middling feminine careerism to an ethic of self-sacrifice in the service of higher things. The feminist ethic of careerism and easy sex is a recipe for national disaster. It has sold many women a bill of goods and a genuinely fulfilling communal family life has been a casualty of the lies that our country's leaders have been telling. It has led to many men without purpose in their lives and just as many women who are friendless, unhappy, and without purpose. Our celebration of the independent woman seems nevertheless to be one of our sacred opinions. No art or film dares to do anything but celebrate the strong independent woman. Our opinion makers worship her. But what does this independent woman really mean? Our independent women seek their purpose in life in mid-level bureaucratic jobs like human resource management, environmental protection, and marketing. They are more medicated, meddlesome, and quarrelsome than women need to be. Without connections to eternity, delivered through their family, such medicated, quarrelsome, and meddlesome women gain their meaning through the seeming participation in the global project. They are agents of the new world, but not new life. Such women are now the backbone of every left-wing cosmopolitan party in the Western world, from the Greens in Germany to the Democratic Party in America. And if our ideal woman is a childless media scold or a barren bureaucratic apparatchik, there is no question whether we can have a future. We can't. There is a question of whether we deserve one. Stats back up the important uh, observations here. Our feminist culture points women, especially young women, away from marriage and family life through its celebration of careerism. Thus, more and more women, every generation, delay marriage and increasingly forego marriage. As women delay and forego marriage, they're increasingly likely to delay and forego having children. When women forego marriage and decline to have children, men are not called forth to duties, to the duties of fatherhood, for instance. And when are men are not called forth to duties of fatherhood, they're hardly called forth to any duties at all. The providing father is the model for all male duty. Many men lose their way when they are not called forth towards such important duties like fatherhood that connect them with enduring commitments through creating a family and leading a marriage. Great nations are ultimately built by strong, responsible, sacrificial male leadership. This is prepared in family life. Yet we expect very little out of our young boys and young men. They are disposable and underemployed. 
And in fact, our feminist culture stigmatizes the fledgling and awkward ambitions for manliness as toxic and antisocial. Instead of promoting family life, our reigning ethos celebrates the independent woman as the greatest invention of our age. We tell ourselves that we have invented happiness. Our only problems are that we haven't found enough ways to empower her, enough ways to allow her ethos to rule. We have a long way to go, we hear, or so we're told. And how have conservatives responded to this revolution in human affairs? Conservatives have tried to convince themselves that the independent woman is really a natural conservative, that they will get ahead by offering her more opportunity and lower taxes. These seemingly independent women should love lower taxes and free trade we have to offer. Conservatives are the real feminists, we tell ourselves, and progressives are the real misogynists. Meanwhile, as conservatives celebrate this corrosive of national greatness, they ignore and implicitly criticize their own voters, the mothers and wives of America's families. Just as Republicans often ignore their own voters in the never-ending search for the black vote, they ignore mothers and wives in their efforts to close the gender gap. It's kind of laughable. Conservative Inc. has also spoken of family values. This was uh, a mantra from the 80s, 90s, mostly, mostly 90s. Um, uh, that has been the, the greatest or the closest conservatives have ever come to really speaking on behalf of their own voters. But this androgynous slogan, family values, has been a folk smokescreen for families that accommodate the independent woman or families with feminism. Every Republican president Every Republican president has pursued policies that encourage women to work after they have children. Cheaper national daycare. We'll deliver it better and less expensively than the liberals. And these are always done in the name of family values. Conservatives spent a generation trying to offer better programs for the independent woman while ignoring the mothers and fathers at the heart of their coalition. But none of this has moved the needle. And in fact, conservatives have continued to lose ground. Why this mistake? Why these errors? Why this strategy? Conservatives have generally accepted the feminist moral high ground, either out of fear of running afoul of the feminist overlords in the country, or out of conviction. Conservative Inc. has been afraid to identify the importance of promoting women's roles within the family and the need for manly leadership. So it talks in this vague sense about family values. The usefulness, however, of this strategy has been greatly overrated. Uh, conservatives have operated within the feminist view of promoting androgyny and used the value-neutral family values lingo to symbolize their own defeat. This can no more go on. We need a sexual counter-revolution. Instead of painting an androgynous picture of the future, the future of a great nation needs to be thoroughly sexed when it comes to family policy. Part of our, of our education project is preparing young men and young women for different destinies. Not careers, not parenthood, another one of these androgynous words. Our educational project uh, as a people is to expect young men to become fathers and all that that implies and young women to become mothers with all that implies. We need to stop looking at every boy and girl as a future worker or a future achiever and start thinking of them as future husbands and fathers and future wives and mothers. And this will need encouragement. It needs intention, since ignoring it obviously leads to less of it. If we want a great nation, we should be preparing young women to become mothers not finding every reason for young women to delay motherhood until they are established in a career or sufficiently independent. We lie to young women when we tell them that it is easy to become pregnant whenever one wants in life. Never does anyone say to the young women that the peak period for pregnancy is between the late teens and the late 20s. Rarely are young women told 
that their ability to conceive children declines quite a bit after the late 20s and declines rapidly after the mid-30s. Ancient people used to pray to the gods of fertility. We pray to infertility gods. Women used to have many children when the odds of dying in childbirth were actually very high. Now deaths in childbirth are rare, but our birth rates are at historic lows. This has to stop if we are to be a great nation. Our very low birth rates reflect our lack of confidence in the future and compromise our ability as a people to act. The rebirth of marriage is a national imperative. Young men must be respectable and responsible to inspire young women to be secure with feminine goals of homemaking and having children. But the problem is much deeper than all of this. Male achievement in our country is not celebrated, though males continue to be among the highest achievers. In fact, we go out of our way to stop celebrating it. Our feminist culture leads us to want less male achievement. Their excellence, after all, creates inequities. That's a shame. That denial of reality has to stop. Every effort must be, must be made not to recruit women into engineering, but rather to recruit and demand more of men who become engineers. Ditto for med school and the law and every trade. Efforts should be redoubled to encourage more men to enter the medical field, space exploration, mining endeavors, and every other high-end and even low-end profession. If every Nobel Prize winner is a man, that's not a failure. It's kind of a cause for celebration. Why can't our celebration of male excellence in sports be translated into all facets of life? More successful men will mean more happy citizenry and a stronger nation. Perhaps mandatory gun training should uh, come about. I'm from Idaho, so I'm required to say that. <laughs> the promotion of wrestling and other uh, acts of physical courage are necessary in our age of soy boys. Our celebration of diversity is just the opposite of the strength that we need as a country. So much in our culture and in our politics complicates the male-female dance in addition to that. There is a natural basis for that dance, and I'll draw pictures if you'd like, but it has uh, to be a priority that we have mores uh, to, to help that dance reach a kind of uh, enduring relationship. There has to be a reasonable uh, ground for mutual confidence that the male and female dance can lead to enduring relations. It is hard to bring men and women together toward enduring relations and community. Feminism and our celebration of sexual liberation complicates this dance, and our institutions propound these ideologies. Clearing the underbrush of the ideologies such as feminism and sexual liberation theory is a prerequisite for making any substantial progress toward building a civilization with strong families as a cornerstone. There are other ways that this must be done. I'm going to only talk about one, though I have three. Uh, uh, that we need to de-emphasize our colleges and universities. That's essential to making progress on family matters. Almost everything in these indoctrination camps complicates the male-female dance. It delays growing up. Apprenticeship programs, master trade schools, and other alternatives to intensive and, extens and expensive college might kickstart adult life and all its concerns in both men and women. I can see men working their way through college again just so college does not have to have such a big impact on their lives. Colleges and universities are, after, so, after all, the citadels of our gynecocracy. And the honor and treasures poured into them must change for a national conservatism to thrive. Much more needs to be said. The stakes are high. National conservatism depends on a social fabric, and a social fabric depends on strong families, and strong families depend on strong men. This will mean a rearrangement in the public and private responsibilities of men and women. The effort to erase the old standard of public men and private women has been a mistake. That standard is a very human standard, and we should approximate it under our conditions if we are to be, build a genuinely national conservatism. Thank you.